By now you've probably heard of a franchise called Forza Motorsport, and Forza has been huge over the past almost 20 years now in pioneering where vehicle simulation on a video game platform has gone. Arguably, Forza is probably the biggest racing franchise there is today, along with the likes of Gran Turismo, Mario Kart, and Need for Speed, but the thing that sets Forza apart is the physics. Now there's quite a bit of a debate going on in the community whether or not Gran Turismo or Forza is more realistic, personally. Gran Turismo, we'll leave that for another video, but the fact of the matter is, people like the physics engine in Forza, it's a fine balance between arcade and sim, and you can adjust certain things to make it more like a sim, or more like an arcade. But how did this physics engine come to be? Because this, something like this does not just happen overnight. Not only is the physics engine a work of art, and pretty amazing, but it has an interesting backstory as well. In 2002, Turn 10 decided to start making a driving simulator, and they wanted to do something that was on the front edge of technology. With 3D technology finally coming to a halt in terms of development and focusing more on raw computational power, they were able to focus on being able to make rigid body simulations a little bit more detailed. While games like Top Gear Rally on the N64, as well as Gran Turismo on the PlayStation, focused on certain aspects of simulation, like with Top Gear's rigid body suspension system with differential suspension, which is amazing how they got that to run on the N64, and Gran Turismo's feel of a racing sim in terms of handling the car, Forza wanted to meld these two together and make it more of a complete experience. This is the story behind the physics engine. Hi everybody, I'm James from Cycle Studios, and today we're going to dive into the physics engine of Forza. First off, I want to provide a very good thank you to PC Gamer for making such a great article for me to get started on. This is actually what motivated me to make this video on this. Andy Kelly wrote a great article about the secrets behind the exquisite handling of Forza Motorsport. So I'm going to cite that in the description and I'm going to talk about some of the other stuff I found. So if we think about physics from a high level, it's basically just a set of rules that the universe operates in. And when we're talking about games, it's not all that much different. In fact, any type of game, a physics engine essentially just tells the objects in a scene or in the game how to behave with one another. Whether that means they run into each other, whether that means they stand on something, whether that means they collide with something, all of that is done with inside the physics engine, and it provides context to the program as to how it's supposed to react with one another. That's really all we're talking about when we say physics engine. And the set of rules that you provide to the physics engine don't always have to be realistic, and in most ways they can't really be 100% realistic, because really what you're doing is you're finding the right balance between playability and realisticity. Because if games were 100% realistic, it would virtually be impossible with the amount of computation needed for every object in the scene to be doing for the game to play well. It's just not possible. And it always ends up in a trade-off between making something playable versus what's technically possible on a system and what looks good. There's never one right answer to every solution. There's always a trade-off in terms of what you're buying into. Want to make it look a little more realistic? Well, you're probably going to have to sacrifice some rendering time in order to make that happen. So you're going to have to scale back on the assets. You only have a specific amount of time in between each draw call, and there's only a specific amount of things that can be computed within that window. So do you want to spend it on the physics, or do you want to spend it on the drawing? Another thing would be, is how realistic do you want to make it? Because in all reality, doing Lagrangian differential mechanics, which is pretty much what analytical mechanics are as a whole, how to explain the world through differential equations and Lagrangian theory, that takes a ton of computational power, and you're probably not going to be able to do that. So if you want something realistic, you have to figure out how it best fits in the environment you're programming in. And that's exactly what Turn 10 decided to do. So essentially what they did was, they started studying how the car evolved and how the car exists as a whole from an engineering perspective. So they read books, they talked to manufacturers, they even worked with them on how things act and operate with their engineering department. This allowed them to create a realistic picture of what they could possibly create on this particular platform. The one huge thing that Turn 10 did was they were essentially researching a multitude of cars to see how they behaved in a number of different situations. And they were saying that even at the time, the F1 simulators were only looking at one particular car. They weren't taking the breadth of the entire automotive circle into their physics engine. And something that really helped this physics engine excel is it being player focused from the very beginning. 
Dan Greenewalt, the now creative director of the Forza franchise, was a programmer for this original engine development. And he claimed that one of the major things in development that he noticed when people were testing the game and trying to play around with the physics engine was that players liked to tap the analog stick in the opposite direction that they were turning in in order to compensate for some kind of oversteer or something like that, or basically just tap it to make sure that it was going in the correct direction. Now this could be a problem because if you're looking at controller data all raw, you're essentially going to make the car spin out because you're going to make a quick decision to turn the car in the opposite direction. So there needed to be a way to filter that data or debounce it so that the car wouldn't spin out every time the opposite direction was tapped when you were in the middle of a turn. So they used a double buffering approach. Essentially what this means is that the controller layer was reading in the input but only sending filtered data to the physics layer, meaning that the direction of the car would be changed not by the direct connection to the physical controller input, but something that felt right and allowed you to tap the stick without the car completely losing control. And using this filtering scheme, they were able to build a successful model for that. And he goes on to explain that a lot of this stuff was just extensions, whether it's assist to the driver through software, but a lot of it was just built on top of each other. And with these small incremental changes, they eventually came to the physics engine that they have now. He also mentioned that to remember that when somebody is driving the Forza engine that's currently existing now, it took over 10 years of R&D to get it to where it is now. And that's pretty awesome how they still use that same logic to kind of control the cars and they've expanded it as it goes on. The most important component of a driving game, especially in a physics engine, is essentially being able to emulate the different feelings and emotions you get when driving a car. As an automotive enthusiast, I can tell you firsthand that driving different cars feels different. They all give you different emotions, different feelings, whether it's good or bad, and each one of those drives are different in experience. Now that being said, trying to emulate that in an environment that's like a video game is much more challenging because essentially what you have to do is break down what you need from real life in order to import into the physics engine to make it feel realistic. And this is totally built around your rigid body physics. For example, if you're modeling a suspension component, you need to figure out different attributes of mechanical wise and how that affects the car's handling, how it affects the car's rigidity, how it affects the car's mass, the moments of inertia, the centroids of the object, all of this changes based on just a suspension component. How do you take all that real life information and import that into the game? And this is where Forza, I think, pulls ahead of some of its competition because it uses real data from cars themselves. Now this provides the tremendous hurdle of data acquisition, and while getting data from 10,000 cars might be tedious, what if you can't get the car at all? I mean, it's not like all the cars are Toyota Corollas or Corvettes or things that are a little bit more readily available. Some of the cars they have in the game are expensive and extremely rare. Maybe there isn't even a fully operational car that exists in the real world that they want to actually put in a racing simulator. So the challenge is trying to figure out how to apply that data when you don't actually have any real data. In this article, Greenwald explains how they accomplished this, and it's actually quite clever. Essentially what they do is they take side-by-side -side comparisons of how physically or realistically a car might handle, and they try and emulate the data based on those similar models that they already have actual data for, and they make a note saying that next time through, if they ever get real data, they need to replace this for the model in the game. Now while I particularly don't like this method, as I consider it engineering by storytelling, the models and regressions that they probably fit to the statistics of the cars that they don't have are probably pretty good, and you don't really notice it in-game, especially if the car doesn't even have a fully functional physics model in the real world, so how are you going to know if you can't actually drive the thing? And I think that plays in their favor a little bit, but they do this statistical guessing so well that it fits in so well with the playability of the game that you just simply don't notice it, and it provides a unique look and feel to that car in that game, which is really what it's about. The driving experience, not always about the absolute one-to-one -one ratio between reality and the game itself. Overall, I think the design philosophy that Turn 10 took was a, a very good one, because, and obviously with the success of Forza Motorsport, it's kind of hard to argue against it. 
But the wonderful thing is, is that this provides a scalable environment to have different experiences with different cars, allowing them to add cars into the game to give them their own unique look and feel. So not only is there a unique rendering of a car that makes you look at it and say, wow, that's a work of art, but it feels the part too. It looks the part and performs the part, and that really is the most important thing when making a game, is making sure that the gameplay aligns perfectly with how it looks and feels. Because if a game can't play well, you don't have a game. That is the whole point of a video game. I hope you all enjoyed this video and a little bit of a story behind the physics engine of Forza Motorsport. I hope you were just as interested as I am. Please leave a like, subscribe to the channel if you enjoyed, and please comment below for anything you want to hear me cover in the future. I hope to see you guys in the next video. This is James from Cycle Studios, signing off.